Okay, welcome back. So in the last session, we were looking at a deeper version of the equanimity meditation. Normally the equanimity meditation, we're looking at the assumption that with friends, we have attachment, with enemies, we have aversion, and with strangers, we have indifference. In the one that we just did, we were kind of going a bit deeper and looking at sometimes there's attachment and sometimes there's love with any of the categories. And what is that like? So now that you've had some time to sit with it, do you feel comfortable sharing any of your impressions, kind of how you are with attachment versus love in friend relationships, in relationships that are difficult, and in relationships that haven't been established? Well, I'll just share my random comment. Oh, um, <laughs> yeah, sure then, Susie, yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry, was Susie saying something? Please go ahead. No, no, one then two, go for it. Um, so I actually found the stranger analysis to be so helpful. And I realized how much expectations I have from strangers and, and the examples that came to my mind. So I live in New York City and, you know, restaurants are crowded, tables are close together and people talk really loudly. And I was thinking like, you know, um, well, why can't, you know, but can't they see like I can't even hear my friend like they're talking so loudly or like in an airplane I, you know whether I'm middle aisle or window um people are not always considered right they're always like walking out over you when like I was thinking of all these things and I was thinking and I don't know any of these people but I have expectations like I expect a certain courtesy level blah 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 where somehow you know because of people I don't like I don't expect something <laughs> and then the people that I do like now it's like that conditioning, like I know to watch for expectations because now I'm thinking in that way, but I hadn't thought about, you know, for strangers that I have that inbuilt and, and where does conventional courtesy and expectations, is that realistic or is that just another, my superimposition on people? Yeah. Yeah. That's really, it's, it's useful, isn't it? I, Maybe some of you um, used to travel more than we do now. <laughs> I was thinking of, um, there was one time where I was in Delhi and then soon after I was in Moscow, like within a week of each other. And I was in the subway in Delhi and I knew it was gonna be chaos and I knew it was gonna be crowded and I knew that people were gonna be all in my face. I knew that before I got there and so I was relaxed. And then in Moscow, everybody was very organized and orderly. And there was one line going this way and one line going that way, you know, and it was sort of the same number of people. They were both really busy city subways. Um, but, you know, the two different cultures approached subway courtesy differently. And it was a really good, it, it was really good for me to see that it was completely based on my own expectations, how much stress I was going to have. If I expected Moscow to be Delhi or Delhi to be Moscow, I would have had a different level of comfort. It wasn't the objective experience of crowded subway and people behaving a certain way. It was my expectation of what I thought it should or shouldn't be. Do you know what I mean? So if you went to India and you expected it to be Russia, <laughs> you'd be like, this is chaos. <laughs> but if you're used to India, you're like, yeah, of course. Why not have a chicken? Why not? You know, sure. You know, it, it's, it's so much a based about if you've made something voluntary or not, then if, you know, if it doesn't feel voluntary, then you resent it. If your expectations are in alignment, then you're not disappointed. If your expectations are inflated, then you are. The whole problem that we're trying to unpack is the assumption that our expectations are self-evident and agreed on by everyone and also permanent and reasonable. When of course the same exact situation feels different on two separate days to you. You know, your own standards are different. And you know, you might've been the one jumping over the middle person's aisle seat inconsiderately and putting your bum in their face because you really had to go to the toilet and you would expect the patience of someone, don't they understand air travel is stressful? Why can't they be patient with me? You know, it's like, but if you have this assumption of someone puts their bum in your face, they must really have to go to the bathroom. Then you're like, wow, that was unexpected, but off you go. I'm awake. <laughs> you know, it's a whole different experience. So that's what we're really unpacking with this whole idea of attachment lies. Yeah, it says, this is why I feel this way. 
And that's not why. It's one tiny component of conditions of why. And that tiny component was your own choice at some point, just one you forgot that you made. And still it's fair to say people could be polite and that would make for a harmonious society. But there is no inherently existent politeness from its own side or rudeness. Knowing that makes you relax. <laughs> you know, that's the long story short. Susie, no, did you that, is su that was such a good example because, you know, I don't oh. have the expect expectation of quietness when I'm in India because they're just rowdy people. So I know when we go out, you know. So, it, uh, yeah, I never thought about that. that is so true. Thank you. Yep. <laughs> yeah. D did anyone else have some interesting thoughts pop up during that meditation? Or uh, parts of resistance? Oh, yes, yeah, Sunny. Oh, we got to unmute you. Unmute. Okay, Perfect. can you hear me now? I can hear you. Perfect. Okay, excellent. Um, so, so, um, meditating on on strangers especially but also on on friends um is what comes to my mind very strongly is how how i like i want them to think well of me so no matter you know if i'm at the store or something you know I'm, i make sure that i smile not to be friendly practically you know no no no, no. i want them to think Oh, when I leave, oh, that was a nice person. And over and over and over again, it's uh, exhausting. But, but meditating on it gives me some distance to observe, uh, to, to relax a little. Yeah, it's, it's trying to get yourself into that zone where you do your best and let go. And then you do your best and let go and let then go. do your best and let go and you fall off track and you try again. And there's just that flexibility of mind that has kind of a general kind altruistic goal for life and yourself without holding yourself to impossible standards or having unrealistic expectations. So it's just that, you know, razor's edge. Yeah. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Other, other thoughts? Yeah, Pamela or Anand? I, I was thinking about that, Sunny, so much myself in the context of how um, in the meditation I was shaping myself as I thought about the friendly person. You know, um, I was picturing, in my case, my adult son, and I was thinking his success is my success. Or in the case of the difficult person who was a colleague, I was thinking, you know, so much about how I am defined, not only are my, how are my needs being met, but how am I defining my own success relative to um, what she's asked me to do or what she's doing versus what I'm doing in that sort of competitive way. And so it, the meditation really gave me a chance to see my my beyond my needs but even just the concretization of my own traits and and particularly again success you know um so that it was a very helpful meditation yeah that's that's a good um nugget me and then mine <laughs> yeah yeah it, enough did you have one yeah, like what I wanted to say was very similar to what Pema said is that um, when we see what other people do annoys us, then we have to look at ourselves. Like, for example, recently there is this IT guy in my work that just comes to your computer and installs something without like asking you anything and just like cleans your I just have to clean your screen and then I mean it, it confronts me because I have an issue with telling people well I need I need to put boundaries then it's less it was less of an issue with me if it wouldn't like pull a point so I think other people are just um a yeah, mirror of what we need to work on yeah, exactly. And, because, and yeah, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's so easy to just give in and go like, go on and yeah, you have to do something. 
Yeah. And the, and the attachment, you know, it's like, it's grumpy to be shown itself. You know, it's almost like um, if someone does something rude or something unexpected or something that invades our space and we need to communicate assertively a healthy, acceptable boundary, it like annoys us because we identify as being easygoing. <laughs> and they're like interrupting our identity of being easygoing. And you're like, no, actually get out of my space, man. Like, give me a minute, <laughs> you know? But they're showing us that we weren't as accommodating or as flexible as we thought we were because we have attachment to the self, you know, and we yeah, have attachment exactly. to the identity, right? And in Israel, it's so hard because like we have also a culture of that I'm really ashamed of, of, uh, of like literally in nature, for example. So what do you do with it? Do you just accept it or you... You can't accept it. It's not so. There's so many confrontation in here already. So it it makes you really think of things deeply, like how to solve confrontations without having things like, um, you know. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> I do. I do. Is anyone else having that Shanti Deva quote come to mind? The leather quote. <laughs> <laughs> about yeah you know it's it's that classic one I'm probably gonna butcher it but you know um where could I ever find enough leather to cover the surface the, of the earth but just wearing leather on the soles of my shoes is equivalent to it what use is there to change the external course of things if I protect my mind what is the need to do anything else something like that and then it begs the question you know should we be passive and complacent and not address things that are wrong and of course not, we need to, but it's not with this tight mind that says I can fix it because samsara is not fixable. But if you can make your mind able to abide with samsaric environments and samsaric reactions in a way where you're bringing the best of you to it and gradually getting yourself out of your own samsara while still being in those kind of environments, you're in the best position to help when there's an opening for change you know it's like there's these little pockets of time where the critical mass or the you know kind of momentum of thought comes together and people are ready to talk about something new you know or they're ready to change something that's been dysfunctional and there's been conversations and frustrations and observations for years and years and years leading up into a big cultural conversation but finally it can happen and then there's a little you know window for change and i think if we're very present we can be aware of the windows but if we're kind of having this pressure of i need to fix it i need to fix it then we are you know not noticing that there's resistance a lot of the time and we're just hitting our head against the wall and stressing ourselves out to no gain but if we're complacent and like, oh, it's samsara, it's all going to hell anyway, degenerate age, it'll end in flames, uh, you know, <laughs> then also we miss the opportunities when change is possible, you know? The, the problem is thinking that it will be finished or fixed. We can develop our mind to its fullest potential and not suffer anymore and be of greatest benefit to others. And in some eon, at some point, all sentient beings will also be enlightened and there will be the great enlightenment and no one's going to hurt each other anymore and we're all going to abide in peace. But it'll be a while. And so in the meantime, how do we not get annoyed, <laughs> you know, in the meantime? And uh, it's again, it's that razor's edge of let go while being engaged, let go while being engaged, you know. It's like you have to give it 100% and not care at all at the same time. <laughs> Does it make sense? Because <laughs> you know when you're in the zone, like we've been in the zone with it where we've had the right approach and then we fall off track one way or the other and we get apathetic and cynical and grumpy or we get too idealistic and naive and gullible and we, we go back and forth between these modalities. But a lot of the time we're like reasonable. <laughs> you know and we know it's possible and we do our best and let go and do our best and let go but the question becomes how do you catch yourself when you've slid into an attachment trap and that's why we do these reflections with kind of the 
three categories that we put people into because it looks a little bit different doesn't it like the way attachment looks with an enemy it looks a little bit different than a friend than a stranger although sometimes the attachment turns the friend into an enemy right but it's important to kind of catch what is my style of attachment personally then i'll notice it when it is lying to me again you know so self-awareness is the key to transformation sometimes you can prevent the same old thing happening for a while but you'll forget and you have to be able to forgive yourself for forgetting because we just don't have enough mindfulness all the time to stay in the right lane that we want to be in so if you're holding yourself up to unrealistic expectations and having attachment to yourself as being a good person, a mindful person, a person on a spiritual path, it's too much pressure. <laughs> you know, you're just a person, you know, just like everybody else. It's fine. You're fine. I was thinking about um, that very sweet, but very cheesy <laughs> children's show that maybe some of you saw Mr. Rogers, you know, it came about, I don't know, in the seventies, eighties and, you know, and it was, it was very cheesy, but I loved it as a child. Like I loved it ridiculously. It's embarrassing to confess how much I love Mr. Rogers. But when I was four, I was like, <sighs> you know, and he would always say, um, you're perfect just the way you are. And the strange psychology of that is when you are fully accepted as you are, you can change, right? But as soon as anything about you is overly celebrated or overly hated or overly negated, you start to identify with it and your attachment starts to like lock in stories around it. But if you're just fine as you are, then the problematic things have space to shift. The ego is very sneaky and complicated and it's always finding ways to reinforce itself. So if we can kind of bring that, um, you know, a little bit cheesy, but really sweet and very useful psychology of you're completely fine just the way you are. And that means you can change or not change, but that's not the criteria for your lovability. You know, like the Buddhas will love you. You know, probably your friends and family will love you, even if you stay exactly as you are right now and you never get any quote better. Even if you get no better, even if you get worse, the Buddhas will still love you. Your friends and family will probably still put up with you. So it's like, love yourself enough to know that. And then you have space to adjust the fact that we are a little bit dysfunctional. Can you feel the difference between feeling like I always need to do, I don't know, self-improvement projects. I always have to work on myself. You know, that is true, but that way of speaking to yourself is too harsh. And there's a backlash that can happen, you know, and it, it's, still attachment to a certain kind of self it's it's not really in alignment with reality so identify with your potential for perfection not the reality of your everyday afflictions because those aren't you yeah susie thank you for the teachings i just want to say that it's it's hard to keep that cool when the chances of another human rebirth are like winning the lottery 10 times in a row. Do you know what I mean? And so my attachment, I know that my attachment can go into crazy. And I want, I, I want that pill to take that makes it go away. <laughs> um, but weirdly, strangely not as well, because my attachment still thinks it's a little bit delicious. So, um, it's, it's keeping that grounded very, gro I love the word grown up at the moment because it resonates the most. And it's, it's been a few decades that I should have been grown up, you know, I should be grown up by now. But I like that sort of feeling of grounded, womanly, I can take care of this in the way that I do in my life generally. But then how crazy and little and young and neurotic and panicky and and freaked out it can feel when you identify these things 
that you have about yourself and you think, shit, I'm going to cut such good money. I'm going to come back a hung, hungry ghost. I'm going to be like, I, I'm really screwed. You know, like I, I've got to get rid of this like yesterday and I've got to be cool and calm about it. Like, <laughs> I don't know how to do that. <laughs> so anyway, go, help, please. <laughs> <laughs> true <laughs> that's not true what you say is true <laughs> I, I you know the, the the most dangerous thing is to be on a roll and be doing really well with your mind and your life and your practice and then fool yourself into thinking you won't be as neurotic as you ever were you know if you say to yourself well i'm glad i'm done with anger now you know then it's like uh oh <laughs> you know oh i'm glad i'm not going to get attached again you know you find you finish some relationship and and you're in the space of loving being single and you think okay well next time i'm not going to do this or this or this or this i've learned my lesson unlikely <laughs> right unlikely um and so if you know that then you're on the lookout if you're in denial it'll just catch you off guard again so it's kind of like have a little faith in yourself and know that the more you think about it, the more stable it will be. But generally speaking, you're already on the right path because you're seeking and you're checking and you have a habit of introspection, you know, and it's going to develop over time and it's going to get more educated over time. But the hard part in a way is done because you're looking. You know, you're looking inward. The hardest part really was getting us this mental continuum to look at itself. How many lifetimes did we spend not looking at ourselves? You know, as a cat, <laughs> right? Just like, I'm going to move from this patch of sun to that patch of sun, and then I'm going to eat. You know, like it's not with a lot of self awareness. Um, you know, bless their hearts, right? But we were like that for a long time. And so even if it all goes to hell and we develop attachment at the time of death and we go to the lower realms, it's not forever. And we still have developed some sort of imprint of self-examination and introspection. It'll kick in again. You know, so you do want that urgency of a perfect human rebirth is incredibly rare having all the conditions come together for another one, incredibly rare, might not happen, might happen, <laughs> might not happen. Even if it doesn't happen, it's not the end of the world. You know, you, you still have reinforced some good traits in yourself that hopefully will kick in again. The question becomes, how are you when you're under stress right now? Which is your default affliction? And to start, you know, just making a project of that, in less stressful situations. You know, when everything goes wrong, do you get paralyzed and disassociative? Ignorance is your problem. Do you get grumpy, angry, critical? Anger is your problem. Or do you get kind of depressed, needy, blah, blah, blah? Attachment's your problem. Of course, all three are your problem, but you've got your kind of go-to, you know? So instead of thinking I'm bad because of it, you think, oh, good to know that's my project. You know, and that's my project in less threatening moments where it's not such a big deal if I mess up. I'm just going to play with it experientially and see what is it to bring a new habit very gently in this area where I know I'm vulnerable to slipping into afflictions. You know, just really gently because you cannot kill your Buddha nature. You can't, even if you tried, you will always have the potential to become enlightened can't ruin it. So that has been with you from beginningless time. All of your nonsense is newish. <laughs> it's variations on a theme, you know, but put your identity there if you're going to put it anywhere. Yeah. So then when you were thinking about the enemy, how can you relate this concept of, of attachment to someone you really don't like. And part of the reason you feel so uncomfortable with them is being your own attachment being thwarted. How did that part of the meditation sit with you guys? Could you, could you feel the relationship of aversion was really thwarted attachment? And that sometimes the resistance is you have an accurate observation but an inaccurate conclusion. 
So your accurate observation might be, they did in fact do this harmful thing, this destructive thing, this rude thing, this uncaring thing, that happened. But the conclusion you come to is, so I'll punish my mind for that. I'll be uncomfortable. <laughs> if I'm not uncomfortable because of their bad behavior, it lets them off the hook. Like what kind of bizarre logic do we have? But it's almost like, you know, that old saying, anger is like taking poison and expecting the other person to die, right? But I mean, we do, we sort of think, because what they did was so unacceptable, I must feel uncomfortable about it, because <laughs> that'll teach them. Right? <laughs> what? <laughs> what? But there is something like that in our head, like, like it lets them off the hook if we're able to be peaceful with bad behavior. There's that, right? There's, there's the other piece, which is, if I forgive them, I have to say it's okay. And you don't have to say it's okay to forgive someone. You can say that behavior in isolation is conventionally unacceptable. And the reason they did it was ignorance and afflictions and suffering. That I get, because I have that. And... Part of why I won't let go is because I'm holding them to the same standard I hold myself, assuming that they've had the same series of tools and life experiences and background context, so they should be able to make the same choices I would make in the same situation. And that's not fair. <laughs> you know, but we're sort of like, we've got something that feels like logic which makes it hard for us to let go of the uncomfortable emotion we have about people we don't like or people who have harmed us or someone we love. So looking at attachment <laughs> related to those we dislike can be really useful because instead of saying, oh, don't be angry, don't be angry, have some patience, have some patience, you just kind of let it be and go back a few steps to what did I think was supposed to happen? Could it? By whose logic? From whose criteria? You know, if I'd lived their same series of lifetimes, I'd have turned out just the same. An affinity with people we don't like is really uncomfortable. We don't want to be able to relate to them. We want to think of them as other. I would never do that. It's like, no, you would. <laughs> if you had the same series of lifetimes, you would. And you think, no, 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 I'd never be a rapist or a serial killer or a child molester or an embezzler of money or a warmonger. Yes, you would. In the right context, you would. Hopefully not now. Hopefully not now, as your mind has come into maturation now. But we have all sorts of variations of the theme. And so having a, a really abrupt disconnect of I am a fundamentally different person than this harm doer is an exaggeration. It's not true. It's confronting, right? Yeah, go ahead. Um, I wanted to ask your advice, Venerable, on this whole, on the enemy thing, because you, know, you, you were saying like, think of your default affliction or what you fall back. And I thought, you know, for me, if I can, it's avoidance, like avoid the person, withdraw, minimize contact as much as possible if I can, which is not the, I mean, it's convenient, but it's not the right, I feel it's not the right way to look at that person. Depends, right? <laughs> Depends. Sometimes you're separating yourself from conditions that bring up negative emotions. Sometimes you're avoiding discomfort that you could handle and then move forward. And only you know that. And sometimes not even you knows that. You know, sometimes you have to sit with it a bit to ask, am I avoiding because this is actually a really rational response and I'm not gonna do any benefit to them or me if we're in this kind of dynamic again? Or am I avoiding it because I just don't like it and I hope it goes away? But if I took some time and grounded myself with my motivation, I'd be really useful here. It's just gonna take some mental effort and a little bit scary because you never know how confrontation's gonna go. So only you know that and <laughs> you might not know that until you sit with it a bit. Yeah. So, so there's a few more techniques I wanted to share with you guys. 
And um, was there was there any more that you wanted to unpack from that meditation or anything you wanted to share before we go into anything new? Do you, do you feel clearer about the way your attachment and the way your love operates? Reinforcing self-knowledge. Because it's, it's possible that it, you know, it went too quick or it was too new and you weren't quite able to touch your version. You could only just kind of listen to what I said and go, oh yeah, maybe, I don't know. You know, so, you know, think about it again in a quiet moment by yourself. Yeah, with friends, how is it? With enemies, how is it? With strangers, how is it? You know, just in a kind of relaxed way. It's useful. Okay, so we'll go on to some new stuff. So this is more of what we did last time. We talked about a bit of this. So now we're going to look at using mindfulness. Before we were looking at lo using logic. Yeah, when we, when we were back here, we were really looking at using logical analysis to cultivate love and using logical analysis to prevent attachment. And there was a number of strategies for each. And, you know, you can look back over um, the last time we did this course, if you want to remember those. But now we're looking at mindfulness instead. And mindfulness in this context is much more about present moment, single pointed focus. So using mindfulness to prevent attachment, we first have to remember that the nature of an affliction, all afflictions, is to make the mind unpeaceful. So if the mind is unpeaceful, if it's rattled, an affliction is either present or coming into presence. And if we can notice it when we're just a little bit unsettled, sometimes that noticing enough dispels it. Yeah, we don't even have to meditate. We don't even need another technique. Just noticing, I'm a little unsettled, or I'm a little upset, or I'm a little uncomfortable, fidgety, something is up. Sometimes just noticing that and you turn your attention towards it, it releases and relaxes. And you don't even need to explain it to yourself. Why did that happen? Where did it come from? Sometimes you don't even need that. It just fades like clouds passing by. A little bit like if you've had a tense day and your tendency is to kind of bring your shoulders up to your ears with tension, you know, gradually. If you think, oh, if my neck hurts, I've got a bit of a headache. Where are my shoulders? Put them down. <laughs> you know, sometimes just noticing that, they release. So similar is true for the mind. If that doesn't work, <laughs> then, you know, it's gone too far, for example, if the mind has really gotten an affliction and it's quite agitated, you can do some of these other mindfulness practices. The first is a clarity of mind meditation which is kind of the classic sky, not the clouds, <laughs> you know, nice one, preliminary to Mahamudra meditation, starting to understand that there is the main mind, the primary consciousness, which is expansive and reflective and non-judgmental. And there are mental factors, which are cloud-like in the sense that they move and color the mind. And if you can shift your attention from all the kind of intriguing movements of the mind to the reflective quality, you naturally release tension and get less hooked by attachment objects. So that's using clarity of mind meditation. Now, breathing meditation can be really useful or not, which is why there's an asterisk there. So it's not always a good idea to do breathing meditation if you have attachment. So um, I'll unpack that a little bit. So I'm sure that, you know, at some point in your life, you were worked up and someone said, take a deep breath, <laughs> count to 10, right? Never mind meditation, never mind Buddhism, you were worked up and someone said, breathe. And sometimes it helps, right? Sometimes it really does help. Sometimes it doesn't. And, and it's good to know that sometimes it doesn't, even if it always works for you because it'll stop you giving that advice with the assumption that it always works. For people that have a lot of anxiety, for people that have had um, physical trauma, and sometimes if they've had other forms of trauma as well, focusing on the breath can make them hyperventilate. And so while attachment and anxiety are very much related and breathing meditation can ground you and make you present, 
remember that anxiety is, you know, overly anticipating a future that feels overwhelming. So if you come present, it helps you release. For some people, the body is not a safe place. So bringing their focus to the body, particularly the breath, can upregulate them and they can get a bit hyperventilating or more anxious and it actually might not work. So um, it's like, just kind of know that in the back of your mind in case you're distressed and, and breathing meditation isn't helping you or you're with someone and they're really distressed and you think, oh, breathing meditation, breathing meditation. And it doesn't seem to be doing the trick. Or, they, or there's someone you know who has a lot of trauma um, and doesn't feel particularly safe in their body. It's an important one to know. So alternatives to that, that might still be grounding in the physical is walking meditation, where you're consciously pulling your focus to the sensation of the soles of your feet. Because usually the feet don't have a particularly emotionally loaded connotation. Usually the feet are somehow safe. <laughs> yeah. So not for everyone. I'm sure there's exceptions. But if you pull your focus, even right now as we're talking, to like, what does it feel like in your socks right now? How are your socks? Are they good socks? Your favorite socks? Are they uncomfortable socks? Are they too tight? Are they nice? Are your feet warm? Are they cold? If you just kind of pull your focus to your feet, you can really start to ground yourself very quickly, even before walking. Yeah. And what's the point of all this? When the mind is unpeaceful and affliction is present, when attachment is present, it's over anticipating a future and what that future needs or trying to pull something into the present that isn't there. And it's jangly. So if you can kind of simplify your focus, it's like a relief for your brain, for your mind, for your body, for everything. It's a way of consciously simplifying for a moment. And, you know, it's interesting to also experiment with asking yourself, what if I'm just bored for five minutes? How about I just be bored? Because <laughs> attachment has so many opportunities to get kind of half satiated, half satisfied. You know, there's always something we can read online, isn't there? We can read something, we can find some article, we can find something easily. We can keep ourselves fed and entertained and keep that sort of half happy, half anxious, stimulated feeling all day if we want to. And then say your, I don't know, your phone runs out of battery and suddenly there's silence and there's nothing to look at. You can panic, people do. Like the panic of not being stimulated. And this might not be you, it might be you, it might be people in your life, but to just say, how about I be bored for five minutes as an experiment, not even a meditation. You just like set a timer on something. I'm going to be bored for five minutes and see what it's like. <laughs> and, you know, I'm sure most of you know, if you do that for five minutes, you have all sorts of interesting ideas and creativity and you remember a to-do list and something you meant to put on the shopping list and a conversation you've been meaning to have and all sorts of things that are actually pretty important return to you. Or a new way of looking at something you've known for a long time deepens within you. So sometimes if you're feeling a lot of hungry attachment energy and you're not quite ready to do a meditation, you're too upregulated, you're too agitated, you can just say to yourself, let's just be bored for five minutes and see what happens. Let's just be bored. Yeah, can be really useful. Um, if you're really, really anxious and the idea of being bored freaks you out and sends you into a vortex of despair, you can say, how about I just be bored for five minutes while drinking a glass of water? <laughs> Slowly. Yeah. So depending on how upregulated you are. You know, and if you're around teenagers or kids and you see, you know, that they're in that really hyper stimulated, hungry, anxious, attached, sort of happy, mostly just stimming sort of thing, you know, instead of telling them to do that, you can just kind of model it and say, let's just sit outside and drink some water and stare at the sky. Peace, <laughs> you know, or something. Model it rather than 
tell it, I would say, is usually more useful with teenagers. But anyway, see, see how it goes. So mindfulness can interrupt the attachment. And, and I think that's an important thing to think about. If we talk about like Tantra, for example, the wisdom of discrimination is developed um, as the result of having transformed your attachment. So the nature of it is kind of described as fire-like. Attachment is like fire in the sense that it could be bright and illuminating and show you things clearly, but because we're full of afflictions, what it does is it's just hungry. You know, it's just consuming fuel. Yeah, like fire is always consuming fuel and consuming fuel, and it'll find all sorts of things to feed it. And it'll just kind of rotate through your senses until it finds one that's getting fed. You know, so you'll feed your literal mouth and then get full and then you'll feed your eyes and then you'll feed your ears and you'll feed your mental consciousness and you'll just keep pinging around your senses, kind of half entertaining yourself while being unsettled and a little anxious and there goes our life, you know. So if instead you can say, I need to stop feeding the fire of attachment, what will happen? It'll die a natural death. If you stop stoking the fire with wood, it'll just go into embers and settle. So you don't have to like abruptly toss water on it and say, no, bad. You can just stop feeding it and it'll quietly die. Does it make sense? So mindfulness is a way of robbing the attachment of fuel. Yeah, and then it's going to run out of steam and it's going to settle down and you'll come back to yourself or you'll come back to your wisdom or come back to some clarity. Plain old physical activity can be useful unless you associate physical activity with attachment patterns and you get neurotic about it. You know, if you um, exercise in an unhealthy way or you become really busy with house cleaning things in a neurotic way that's not great. But if generally for you, just doing something with your body gets you present and grounded, that can be one another way to prevent attachment or de-escalate it once it's there. So then you can also use mindfulness to cultivate love. And it's, it's pretty basic. It's what you would assume it to be. So a strong motivation and maintenance of it both in and out of meditation, and then reconnecting to the natural calm and clarity of the mind through mindfulness meditation with a, quote, focal object of your choice. So whether it's the mind itself, whether it's the breath, whether it's a mental image, whether it's walking, you're just reconnecting with the natural calm and clarity of the mind. And that can tap you back into a motivation of love if that's already one of your agendas in life. You know, so a strong motivation and maintenance of it. Yeah, a strong motivation and a maintenance of it. Basically, you have to say to yourself, what's the point of all this? Life, relationships, work. What's the point of all this? And you have to decide yourself. And in the Buddhist tradition, we would say the point of all this is to understand suffering and its causes and remove them, understand happiness and its causes and cultivate them, you know, i.e. develop bodhicitta, but put it into a word that resonates with you. You know, the purpose of life is peace, inner and outer, or the purpose of life is compassion, inner and outer, or interdependence or whatever is a word or a phrase or a poem that strikes a chord. And it's something that you believe even when you're in a terrible mood. <laughs> you just maybe don't touch it with a kind of experiential feeling when you're in a terrible mood. But if someone were to say it to you, you couldn't pretend that it wasn't true, even though you were grumpy that they reminded you. Yeah. So, you know, if you're in a terrible mood, you're really in a grump, or you're like depressed and angsty and curled up in a ball on your bed, sort of quietly weeping with your cat, or you're sort of like, I don't know, hyper busy and doing all sorts of tasks and just like keeping yourself from thinking about the scary thing or whatever your form of neurosis is, and someone you love grabbed your wrist and said, remember, dot, 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 
what would help bring you back to yourself? Yeah. So, you know, if someone, so for me, it would be remember bodhicitta. And I'd be like, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> right. Because there's a lot of background thought that went into that word. It's not like it, it's a magic word that has word meaning in and of itself, but for me, it has meaning. So what's a word for you that has meaning that if someone were to say, remember, you would come back to yourself. And when I say come back to yourself, I mean, come back to your stable wisdom mind as opposed to your afflicted self. And if you can actively, like preemptively do that, then the afflictions don't really have room to pull you off track. So if you wake up in the morning and you think the purpose of my life is to work towards my potential so I can be of benefit to myself and others. And you say that again and again in your head until you believe it again or until you feel it again or until you can get out of bed again. And it could be that there are rough days where even that doesn't work. But if you can start working on it on days that aren't too bad, it's got a likelihood of kicking in on harder days. Yeah. So, you know, it's not like you're forcing yourself to believe something you don't already believe. What you're doing is reminding yourself of something you already have a connection with. Yeah. So it's not like you're brainwashing yourself. You're reviving the life force. <laughs> you know, you're giving vitality back to yourself, speaking what you've already held to be true. So that's like preemptive strike for attachment, because if your mind is really in a loving atmosphere or in an altruistic atmosphere or bodhicitta atmosphere, if you're really, that's the underlying focus of your motivation, then it takes very little throughout the day to kind of touch back in, like you're refreshing the, the browser on your, you know, internet browser, right? You hit refresh and it kind of like makes things work better again, right? this is what you're doing in your mind all day is you're just kind of hitting refresh on your bodhicitta or whatever it is. And it protects your mind from your crazy. You don't slip then. And it takes a while for it to be something that's a pervasive thing throughout a day. But if you can work on it on ordinary, not too stressful days, ordinary degree of stress days, then it will kick in when you need it really desperately in hard days. Sometimes it takes a horrible day or a tragedy to remind you that you should have been doing it the whole time. But, you know, don't beat yourself up. It's like a mindfulness spell. Yeah, and, and I try and like frame a lot of disturbances in a day as mindfulness spells to bring me back to my motivation. You know, so someone rings at an inconvenient time and I see my phone and I go, ah, now? Then I try and think, oh, mindfulness spell, bodhicitta. Okay, yes, hello. <laughs> you know, it, it, so it's like the very inconvenience of it. I'm trying to associate it with come back. Yeah, come back, come back. You know, someone's using the leaf blower next door. You're like, why leaf blowers? Why do they exist? Why now? Why? <laughs> you know, mindfulness spell. <sighs> okay, come back, <laughs> you know, like that. What are your thoughts about that approach? Is it does it feel like it would work for you? Or are you feeling like maybe that's not applicable to your lifestyle? If you had a, a driving force, simple motivation, you could say to yourself and then tap back into that throughout the day, do you think it would protect your mind or at least help? Yeah, um, yeah, Tom. I was, I like that idea very much, but I think that at this point in my practice, I'm not able to, you know, remember it. So I get pulled into whatever circumstance and then it's like, I'm completely gone. And then later I remember, oh my God, I forgot my mindfulness and I forgot bodhicitta on emptiness. So I, I had heard that there's some sort of app that dings every few hours or something like that, so that you can remember, I haven't been successful in finding it, but I would need some literal bell because I can't remember on my own at this point. Yep, there's a few. There's a um, inner job description, inner job description. And that one even has a little journal that goes with it. You can check in at the end of the day. Um, 
and uh, you can set when you want the bells to go off so it's not at a weird time. There's also, I want to call it like we croak. We croak, I think one word. And it reminds you of death randomly throughout the day with all sorts of pithy quotes, <laughs> which, <laughs> which cracks me up, but also helps a lot because so much of our stress, we'd be like, if I knew I was dying tomorrow, I would not care about this. I would not be giving my energy to this. This would not be an issue. I'd just be like, next, <laughs> you know? So if death helps you remember life and its meaning, um, a little uh, death reminder can be useful. We croak. <laughs> Thank you. I will look those up. Thank you so much. Yeah. I mean, I used to, before we had phones, you know, I, I, you, well, I guess everyone else had phones before I had a phone. <laughs> um, um, I used to use putting my shoes on and taking my shoes off, you know, because there's a lot of shoes on, shoes off in my line of work. <laughs> right? um, or um, glasses on, glasses off. So I would tie it to something that I already did. Yeah. Yeah. Ryan, did you have something? I was just going to say, you don't even need an app. You can just set a timer on your phone, right? There's a yeah. lot and, and just timers. You say you want every two hours, set a two hour timer. And then, and then when it goes off, reset it. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. <clears throat> no need to overthink it. Exactly. You could even have it play a song that reminds you of your path, you know, or a mantra or something like that. Yeah. Yeah, technology is great. But yeah, if you're not having a technology um, moment, if you're wanting to kind of get less of that, I would just tie it to things you already do. Um, there's a very long tradition of doing this. It's called Bodhicitta Mindfulness and Lama Zopa Rinpoche teaches whole long discourses on it. And it's, you know, when you open your door, think this. When you close your door, think that. When you go to the toilet, think this. When you close the lid of the toilet, think that. <laughs> you know, when you turn on the lights, when you turn off the lights. And it's, it's called Bodhicitta Mindfulness. And it's really what I think is more efficient for us to cultivate than just kind of basic mindfulness. Um, why not upgrade our mindfulness? Because you don't wanna just be aware of what you're doing while you're doing it. You want an agenda, yeah? What is the point of being aware of what you're doing while you're doing it? Yes, it will help you develop concentration and that's an important thing, but don't you wanna be developing on the spiritual path? So your agenda of mindfulness is have I stayed in alignment with my life priorities or have I slipped? You know, have I gotten lost in attachment or have I stayed in, in sync with what I think is important? So um, mindfulness plus, <laughs> yes, mindfulness plus. All right, so that's love cultivation using mindfulness. So here are those two kind of ways to use mindfulness for cultivating love versus antidoting attachment. Um, as you look at those, is there anything you want to unpack or um, clarify or question before we leave it there? And just uh, jump right in. If so, I can't see you with the PowerPoint up. Okay, good. Should you want to do it, you could. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I was thinking that um, we'd have a little quick break and then do um, a forgiveness process if you felt up to it, but this is using um, someone in your life that is really tricky. Do, do you have mental space for it or do you wanna do something more gentle? Cause we could do a clarity of mind meditation instead. Um, but are you up for a hardcore deep dive troublemakers? Okay, <laughs> so if you don't have a horrible enemy in your life, well done karmically, think of a politician, you know, or something, you know, right? <laughs> so, um, so we'll have a five minute break and, um, and then we'll come back and do a forgiveness process. But kind of while you're in the break, have a think of who's my tricky person I really need to do a bit of work on. Okay, five minutes. <laughs> 